Uh, good evening, everybody. It is my tremendous pleasure tonight to introduce our distinguished speaker and our first of two Smilo Cares um, series events, Dr. Donald Abrams, a world renowned, if I don't mind saying, oncologist and integrative medicine specialist. Um, Dr. Abrams is a professor emer emeritus at the University of California, San Francisco, where he served as chief of the hematology oncology division at San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, in that role, he's mentored and trained countless medical oncologists, notably, I don't mind saying, myself and uh, my wife, who's a member of the faculty here at Yale as well. Uh, with over four decades of experience in cancer care, Dr. Abrams has been a pioneer in integrating complementary therapies such as medicinal cannabis into conventional medical treatments. Uh, I can recall one of our lectures we had uh, years ago uh, discussing uh, not only the uh, mechanism of action of uh, cannabinoids, but also the, really the great difficulty and the obstacles that had to be overcome uh, in uh, the research and acceptance for medical marijuana. Um, he's one of the earliest physicians to explore the therapeutic benefits of marijuana, particularly for symptom management in cancer and HIV AIDS patients. His research and clinical work have made him one of the foremost experts on the medical use of cannabis, helping to change perspectives on its role in modern healthcare. And today, uh, Dr. Abrams will share his invaluable insights on the evolving landscape of medical marijuana, its potential uses in patient care, and the science behind its efficacy. So uh, I hope you all join me in welcoming Dr. Abrams. A massive round of applause, which we cannot hear uh, because we're all on mute in the audience. And um, uh, one of the reasons I went to Northern California to train in San Francisco was uh, just a, a very informal uh, style uh, of learning, and we are going to emulate that tonight in our webinar. So I am going to um, just lead the discussion with some questions, some of what I think are the most uh, interesting questions in medical marijuana and cannabis, and we'll hope that everyone will add uh, their questions to the chat as we go. And I'll, uh, we can stop, we're doing integrate questions. So I thought um, I'd start uh, with a question just about the, the history of medical marijuana. And uh, Dr. Abrams, if you could share with us a little bit about the roots of interest in uh, cannabis as medicine and, and some of the early uh, challenges that we faced in its development. Yeah, thanks, Neil. It's great to see you again. Thanks for having me here. So cannabis is a botanical that goes back uh, millennia. There's evidence from uh, sites that were dug up 3,000 years ago that cannabis was probably used as a medicine. Uh, sites were originally in China, south of Mongolia, and even in Siberia. The famous Siberian Ice Princess is a 2,700-year-old mummy that's very well preserved in the ice in Siberia. And under the... Uh, MRI, she appears to be a young woman in her 20s with metastatic breast cancer, lesions in her bones. And around her waist, she had a belt at the end of which was a pouch in which were found the flowers of the female plant of cannabis sativa, sativa which led the anthropologist or archaeologist, whoever makes these assumptions, to suggest that perhaps she was using cannabis to treat the symptoms of her cancer or perhaps even the cancer itself, which I think is sort of a big jump because we don't know that everybody in that tribe wasn't buried with cannabis around their waist. In any event, it's felt that cannabis moved from China down the Silk Route to uh, India and then further west into the Arab world. It was brought to the, the West, if you will, by W.B. O'Shaughnessy, a surgeon working in India in the British East Indies Company who saw all the benefits of cannabis and brought it to the United Kingdom where it reportedly became Queen Victoria's favorite treatment for her menstrual cramps. Although nowadays people say, no, that's not true, but fake news, but how are we ever gonna figure it out at this point in time? Came across the ocean to the United States where physicians prescribed cannabis to patients up until 1937. In 1937, the Cannabis Tax Act was imposed by a prohibitionist who was felt to be a racist. Uh, although I met his niece and she told me he was no more of a racist than any white man in 1937. But he felt increased use of cannabis recreationally by African-American jazz musicians and Mexican migrants was going to lead to increased 
crime and mental illness in the United States. So he imposed a tax of a dollar an ounce for medical use and a hundred dollars an ounce for recreational use, which in 1937 dollars was a lot of money. So in 1942, the uh, cannabis was removed from the U.S. pharmacopoeia, our national formulary, and that act was opposed, interestingly, by the American Medical Association, who believed that it was a useful medicine and should be available. In 1970, in the Controlled Substances Act, cannabis was placed as a Schedule One substance, which means high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. And it's up there with heroin and LSD and psilocybin. And that's what's made it so difficult for us to do research on cannabis because the only legal source of cannabis for research up until very recently was NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And NIDA has a congressional mandate that they can only study substances of abuse as substances of abuse. So if you want to study the potential therapeutic benefit of cannabis, up until very recently, you had to get it from NIDA, but they could not fund a study looking for benefit. They could only fund studies looking for harm. So that is what has made it very difficult for us to move the envelope forward and, and designing randomized placebo-controlled trials that will satisfy our oncology colleagues that cannabis is a useful medicine. Uh, Dr. Davis, uh, I'm sure we'll get to it a little later, but when you mentioned of late, do you, do you think we've cleared that hurdle now with legalization of recreational marijuana? Do you see a lot of clinical trials starting uh, with medical marijuana? Do you think we're still kind of stuck in neutral? Well, it's a great question. I mean, I think it was much easier when NIDA was the only legal source because you got their marijuana. It wasn't fabulous. It wasn't, you know, what we could get in dispensaries today but it was a single product that everybody studied the same. Now, I'm very happy that I'm retired and not in the cannabis research field because what would I study? You know, would I study inhalation, which is what I have been studying, or would I study, you know, a tincture, or would I study THC or CBD or CBN now that we know all these other components of the plant? Personally, I believe that nature did it best and that the plant is what we should, you know, study. But again, I'm going to go out there and be pretty radical. This has been a medicine for 3,000 years. I don't think it needs to be scheduled at all. You know, there's a plan now to move it from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. I don't think we need to interpose physicians between the patients and their medicine. I think cannabis should be available like echinacea and turmeric, but regulated like tobacco and alcohol, two things which are much more dangerous than cannabis. So in answer to the question, you know, the National Cancer Institute just made millions of dollars available for studies of cannabis, but none of them could be randomized controlled clinical trials. They ought to be observational studies of people already using cannabis while they're getting treatment for their cancer because they don't want to deal with all the hurdles that you have to jump through and all the potential different types of cannabis products that could or should be studied. So, you know, it's a, it's a, I don't know the answer to that question. Interesting. Um, I think I see one question. Uh, Sally, did you have a question? There's a oh. hand raised. <laughs> okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe a mistake. Um, well, I think we'll, I know we will come back to this question of what's the best mode of administration and the problems with standardization of dosing and on, and those things. But before we do that, uh, Dr. Evans, can you tell us just a little bit about what kinds of indications has medical marijuana been used for uh, in symptom management or directly treating cancer? Yeah, so th let me just take a step backwards and say that we know a lot about how cannabis works, even though we don't get to study it so much. We have discovered in the body two forms of receptors, the CB1 or cannabinoid 1 receptor and the cannabinoid 2 receptor. The CB1 receptor is actually one of the most densely populated receptors in our brain, even though we don't learn about that in medical school. That shows you the extent of reefer madness. 
The CD2 receptor was initially identified on cells of the immune system. So we in all animal species down through sea squirts have these receptors. You've never seen a monkey smoking a joint, so why would we all have these receptors? Well, we like make our own endogenous cannabinoids, like we make our own endogenous opiates, the endorphins, we make endocannabinoids. And Michael Pollan, our journalist in Berkeley, who wrote the fabulous book, The Botany of Desire, suggests that the reason that we and all animal species have this system is to help us to forget. And in his next book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, he's writing about, uh, he's trying to catch his own food in, in one chapter he's kneeling in the woods with a rifle on his shoulder waiting to kill a deer and he suggests that the reason that we and all animal species dependent on praying e-y-i-n-g for sustenance have the system is to help us to forget pain many people say that it's the system of cannabinoid receptors and endocannabinoids that is, allows women to have a second child <laughs> they forget the pain so so pain obviously is one of the indications, in my opinion, for using cannabis. And we did a study in patients with HIV-related peripheral neuropathy, pain from uh, their viral infection, and showed that cannabis was better than placebo. And it's also being looked at and evaluated in patients with cancer chemotherapy-related neuropathy as well. We also did a study in my group looking at the uh, synergy the one plus one equals five of adding cannabis to sustained release opiates, OxyContin and MSContin, and found that even though the cannabis, inhaled cannabis didn't change the concentration of the opiate, the patients had further relief in pain that they would have had just from the opiate alone. So pain, I think, is a number one indication. The best evidence in the literature is that uh, Delta-9 THC, the most psychoactive component of the plant, which has been licensed and approved since 1986 for treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. So two different preparations are available, nabilone and dronabinol. Personally, I believe that the plant is better because when you take Delta-9 THC out of the 450 other compounds that sort of balance it and increase its benefit and decrease its harm, I think it's a different medicine. So nausea, especially with chemotherapy, is something that uh, I see all the time. As you know, Ondansetron or Zofran makes our patients very constipated. And if you have cancer and you're being treated with chemotherapy, I don't think you like it when your body seems to stop parts of your body. So I have patients who completely forego their ondansetron and choose to treat their nausea with uh, cannabis and do it quite successfully. Cannabis is also the only anti-nausea medicine that also increases appetite. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, appetite is often an issue for patients with cancer undergoing treatment. Uh, none of the other anti-nausea meds that we do increase appetite. Interestingly, people that chronically use cannabis, however, don't tend to be obese or get diabetes. In fact, cannabis use seems to decrease metabolic syndrome. So the increase in appetite is not a chronic thing that keeps you eating forever. Cannabis is good for sleep. Many of the studies of cannabis looking at another indication have found that patients who use it sleep better. And one of the aspects of that is that old cannabis, the Delta-9 THC degrades into another cannabinoid called cannabinol or CBN. And people who are looking at the isolated cannabinoids are now looking at cannabinol as a useful sleep preparation. When you sleep better, I think you're less anxious and less depressed. So although some people do have idiosyncratic reactions and get paranoid, freaked out, anxious, or depressed from using can cannabis, I think it is uh, something that's useful for anxiety, uh, depression, and stress. I mean, look at how many people drink alcohol in this country. And alcohol is so mainstreamed. I've been a physician now for, as you said, over four decades. We won't go into detail. The number of patients I've admitted to the hospital with complications of cannabis, I count on one hand. It was one gentleman 
when I was an intern a hundred years ago who had cannabis laced with PCP. The number of people I've admitted to the hospital with complications of alcohol, unable to count. Countless. Numerous. Countless. You know, so, so, you know, cannabis, I think, is much better than alcohol for decreasing anxiety and stress, too. So, but that's, I mean, you brought up one really um, neat observation, which is a, a theory of mine, too, of why integrative medicine writ large, I think, is tough to study in trials because it is not just one thing. And uh, the dronabinols uh, of the world, which we so rarely prescribe because they have relatively little effect, I always wonder, is it because it's the whole thing? It's not just the, uh, the one thing. Um, uh, totally. When people say, well, does integrative oncology work? I say, oh yeah. If I submit a grant to the National Cancer Institute saying I want to study integrative oncology, they're going to say, too broad. I'm going to say, okay, nutrition and cancer, too broad. Okay, cruciferous vegetables, too broad. Okay, broccoli. Okay, no, too broad. <laughs> Indol-3 carbonyl, bing. We yeah. are reductionists when it comes to funding cancer studies, for sure. Yes. Um, and so there are a, a couple of questions have, have already come in um, on the chat, uh, which I want to get to as they come up. Um, the, the first was, um, your impressions about is there a uh, hyperemesis syndrome related to uh, using uh, cannabis and are there alternatives to addressing it besides eliminating the cannabis? I guess a, a better question is how do you manage the side effects if you are having some side effects from your cannabis? Do we dose titrate slowly? Do we stop? Are there any other treatments that can help with some of the side effects? Yeah, well, for, let's go to the hyperemesis syndrome. Uh, it exists, I guess. Uh, we read about it a lot in the literature as more people are using it. it. Tends to be seen in young men who are chronic users and taking a hot shower, stopping use are ways to do it. I mean, I have been an oncologist for 41 years in San Francisco and I missed my first patient with the hyperemesis syndrome. It was a woman that I was seeing here at the Osher Center for Integrative Health. And she told me how she was vomiting all the time and she had to run out of our interview and and use the the bathroom and she came back and and then when she left uh, i was teaching a fellow and the fellow said is that the hyperemesis syndrome and i said oh my god so i ran after the patient who was going down the elevator i said maybe you should stop your cannabis because i forgot about that but that would be the only case i've seen in 41 years and uh, you know what can i say yeah. so yeah. side effects of cannabis are you know compared to other medications that we use, especially as oncologists, are really quite trivial. I mean, people do get stoned, uh, euphoria. Uh, sometimes that can be disconcerting if people are not used to it or they can have a paranoid reaction or a dysphoric reaction. And for that, you stop. A hot shower also, I find, is sometimes useful for uh, other uh, cannabis-related side effects. Uh, rapid heart rate, low blood pressure, high blood pressure. One of the reasons that I don't recommend cannabis use to elderly patients with cardiac disease, because it can lead to both high and low blood pressure, both of which can lead to falls in the elderly, which as you know, can lead to hip fractures, which can be a pre-morbid condition. So, uh, you know, otherwise you get a dry mouth and red eyes, and I don't know how difficult those side effects are to to deal with, you just let time take its toll and it'll go away by morning. Yeah, oh, that's terrific. I want to come back to that, the thought about, are there any people other than elderly cardiac conditions who should not use medical marijuana? marijuana? But another question had come in, uh, we, we talked a lot about the supportive care and symptom management with uh, cannabis, but what, what do we know about the actually direct anti-cancer effect? Are there yeah, people right, who recommend right. it for treating cancer and oh. what kinds? No, I do not recommend it for treating cancer. Cannabis does not treat cancer. Where does that thought even come from? I mean, it came from investigators at Virginia Commonwealth University who published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute in 1975, an article that uh, uh, THC, Delta-9 THC, Delta-8 THC and cannabinol inhibited Lewis lung adenocarcinoma cells in vitro, so in the test tube when they added these isolated cannabis chemicals, it impeded the growth of that tumor. 
In fact, CBD led to increased growth of that tumor in that study. <clears throat> well, since that publication in 1975, research into the anti-cancer effects of cannabis has gone offshore for a number of the reasons that we've talked about and is mainly done in Spain and Italy. And my friend and colleague Manuel Guzman's lab at Complutense University in Madrid <clears throat> studies the effect of cannabinoids on metabolism. And the brain is the most metabolically active cells in the body. So they would grow up rat brain in, in a test tube and add cannabis. And they would look at the effect on metabolism. And they said, maybe we can do this faster if we grew up a rat brain tumor. So they grew up a brain tumor and they added the cannabis and everything died. And they said, oh, maybe we did something wrong. So they did it again and everything died. They said, maybe this is a bad batch of cannabis. So they went back to the normal rat brain and everything lived. And since that time, they've done very elegant research that the cannabis, particularly the THC, complexes with that receptor on the tumor brain cell and causes it to commit suicide, apoptosis, programmed cell death. They've also demonstrated that cannabinoids block vascular endothelial growth factor, the chemical that allows new blood vessels to form to feed tumors. And they also demonstrated that cannabinoids block a protein called matrix metalloproteinase 2, which allows cancer cells to become invasive and metastasize. All of that happens in the test tube. They also take nude mice without an immune system and they transplant human tumors into those mice. And cannabis can decrease the growth of all sorts of cancers, lymphoma, breast, pancreas. But again, these are not people. And Aza Raza wrote a book called The First Cell. She's a hemato-oncologist uh, in New York now, and she believes that we do it all wrong in developing cancer drugs by looking at what happens in the, the test tube and in animals, because very rarely does it translate into a benefit in people. Years ago, I saw patients coming, taking very highly concentrated preparations of cannabis, THC, and CBD to cure their cancer. Cannabis does not cure cancer. There is one study that's been published now, again, in patients with brain tumors. I say, if anybody's going to benefit, maybe it's a brain tumor patient. And this study it was very small. 12 patients got nabiximols, which is a whole plant extract that's been modulated to have a one-to-one -one ratio of THC to cannabidiol or CBD. Uh, this drug is available all over the world for multiple sclerosis spasticity but not in the United States because no studies done here have demonstrated any benefit. In this study, 12 patients with recurrent brain tumor, glioblastoma, the most aggressive form, use this under the tongue spray cannabis medicine and nine patients use placebo. These were recurrent glioblastoma, so very aggressive. At the end of six months, two thirds of both groups had their tumors recur. But interestingly, despite that same effect on the tumor, the people using the spray at one year, 84% were alive compared to 44% of the placebo. Again, the study was not powered for survival as an endpoint, and it's a very small study, but it's now being reproduced in larger trials to see if there really is this benefit to adding this preparation uh, to standard chemo in recurrent brain tumors. Yeah, it always uh, struck me that one that one study looked compelling or intriguing anyway, and there's very little follow up in decades now. Yeah, years years. well, not decades, in, but years. Yeah. Um, another question I has come to the chat, uh, uh, Dr. Chambers, getting at the idea of uh, medical marijuana for pain, um, and it uh, a, a woman who is suffering with. Uh, pain as a result of post-mastectomy pain syndrome, has tried edibles such as gummies, beverages uh, like Wink, um, and looking for what, how do you advise people you're caring for to find the best preparation, the best dose uh, that will work for the pain? And when, when I guess the correlate of that is, 
when would you tell someone, you know, I don't think that medical marijuana may be the best solution for your pain and you might want to look at something else? Well, first of all, as an integrative oncologist with a particular passion besides marijuana for nutrition, I am very much against sugar for people with or without cancer. And edibles and gummies are all sugar. So I say avoid that. I guess we could talk about uh, 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 ro modes of delivery at this point in time. I've studied inhaled cannabis. When you inhale cannabis, the peak plasma concentration of the tetrahydrocannabinol, the active ingredient, is reached in two and a half minutes. And it then dissipates quite rapidly over the next 30 minutes. When you take cannabis by mouth as a gummy, as an edible, or as a capsule, it takes two and a half hours to reach a much lower peak that lasts a lot longer. And when the Delta 9 THC, the most psychoactive component, goes through the liver, the liver metabolizes that into an even more psychoactive 11 hydroxy metabolite. So I see a lot of patients who go to the dispensary and they're told only eat a quarter of the cookie. And they do and nothing happens, so they eat another quarter and nothing happens, so they eat the whole cookie. And then they call me three days later saying they're never going to do that again because they had a dysphoric reaction and wound up in the emergency room. So if you want better control over the onset, the depth, and the duration of the effect, I think inhalation is better than oral ingestion. We in California now, where we've had legal cannabis since 1996, have multiple different preparations. And the ones that I think are best for cancer patients are probably tinctures. So tinctures are liquids that are extracts of the plant, sometimes with manipulations of the ratio of THC to CBD. And when you put a liquid in your mouth, you immediately absorb some from under your tongue that reproduces the kinetics of inhalation. And then you swallow the rest and that reproduces oral ingestion. So you get rapid onset and a more prolonged duration of effect. The use of cannabis, I, I must tell you that I wrote an editorial with an investigator uh, at Harvard because there was a group that did a Delphi, a consensus statement on using cannabis-based medicines in pain. And they said, start with CBD at five milligrams and increase to 40 milligrams and if that doesn't work, add THC. Well, my colleague and I said, where did they get any evidence that CBD has any effect on pain and that dose? I mean, the only study that I believe really demonstrated a clinical benefit of CBD looked at 600 milligrams in patients with social anxiety disorder and put them up in a simulated public speaking experience. And those who have the CBD were less anxious than those who didn't, but that's 600 milligrams. And here we're saying start with five. <clears throat> there was an even more compelling study of CBD in an experimental pain model where patients got CBD or placebo and they were told they were getting CBD or placebo. So then they inflicted them with an experimental pain model. And the patients who were given placebo and told that it was CBD had as much relief of their pain as those who got the real CBD. So I think CBD is not my favorite. And they did a study of CBD versus placebo in patients with advanced cancer and found no improvement in symptoms or quality of life of CBD over placebo. So the question, what should this patient take for post-mastectomy pain is, I don't, there's no answer because it hasn't been studied. So it's a question of experimentation. And for dosing, the mantra is start low and go slow. So start with a low dose. And I would say of cannabis or particularly THC because THC complexes with the cannabinoid receptor. CBD actually changes the shape of that receptor so it can't bind THC or our own endogenous cannabinoids. So I say start with a, a cannabis preparation slowly and see, you know, it doesn't work for everybody. Your, see, your cannabinoid receptor might be quite different from mine by pharmacogenomics. Mm -hmm. Some people smoke marijuana <clears throat> and have no effect. Some people get euphoric. Some people get paranoid. I mean, different 
things work differently in different people. So yeah, your your answer brought up I think two uh, interesting uh, topics for me, and and probably the quickest answer, uh, the shortest, most direct topic is what do you think about topical uh, preparations for local pain? Do you, is there something to that? Should we just be smoking it or or tincturing it and not spending the sixty dollars on our topical preparation? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I know that my husband. I uh, wrote the book, Marijuana Gateway to Health, How Cannabis Protects Us from Cancer and Alzheimer's. So he's a big marijuana proponent. And he also judges for the High Times Cannabis Cup. So he often gets a lot of free samples. And he's gotten a lot of cannabis uh, sprays and topicals that we don't necessarily use, but we're also in the dog show world. And many people in the dog show world are women, are women of a certain age and a certain body habitus who tend to get pains from kneeling up and down with their dogs. And so we would bring them these products and they said, where do I get more? This works. You know, how it works, I'm not sure because cannabis is fat soluble. So how do you, if it goes on your skin, how does it even get absorbed into deeper tissues? I, I don't know, but people have been working on patches like that push the cannabis across the cutaneous boundary, but just topical. I mean, I guess that CBD study that I just mentioned shows that expectancy is part of the effect. Call it the placebo effect or not, but if it works in 33% of patients, that's more patients than some of our chemo works in, isn't it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and hey, a lot cheaper. Um, yeah. <laughs> You know, a, a second question really is another sort of your opinion, editorial comment. In Connecticut, we uh, have our medical dispensaries, which are staffed by pharmacists. And as pharmacists, there's really not clear what the training, education experience is needed uh, to be a pharmacist in a dispensary. And they are dispensing advice. And it often sounds a lot like what you described. Um, CBD is better for cancer. THC is uh, maybe a little bit better for pain and um, uh, keeping the two separate. And it, it sounds like you have a, a different philosophy about that. And how would, how would you recommend that people prepare themselves before they go visit uh, the dispensary and talk to the pharmacist? Yeah, well, I mean, you're lucky in Connecticut to have pharmacists uh, that are in your dispensaries. <clears throat> how they're trained, I don't know, but I think there is a lot in the literature. If you do a PubMed search on cannabis, there's a, there is a lot out there now. I mean, when I was doing my clinics from home during COVID, Clint would come in and say, I hate it when you tell patients, go to the dispensary and ask the bud tender what works best. And I said, but they're on the front lines dealing with patients day in and day out. So they must know what works best for sleep and for pain and for... He said, but they're not trained. And Ilana Braun at Harvard and I, uh, she included me in a study she did uh, surveying bud tenders to find out what kind of training they had. And they basically didn't have much. A number of years ago, two graduates of our school of pharmacy here at the University of California, San Francisco came to me and asked, what would you think if we opened a dispensary? I said, that would be fabulous. They came back a year later, said it costs a million dollars down to open a dispensary. So they can't do that. So they opened a cannabis concierge practice where I tell my patients about them and how to get in touch with them. And they talk to my patients and they are pharmacists. So they're interested in what the patient's diagnosis is, what other medications they're taking and what they're trying to treat. And then they will recommend for them a tincture that they think will be the best thing that they could use. Again, how are they basing this on the basis of what information and in view of the fact that there's very little published data on that particular tincture in that particular condition? I don't know. It is a bit trial and error. And yeah, you know, it's a, it's it sounds like the message, the message I'm getting is that the pharmacist or bud tender can be a useful starting place, but it's also not unreasonable for people to do their own experimentation, try different things, and uh, 
before they but they ultimately decide it's not going to be I mean, effective for them. We're oncologists. The drugs that we give people are so toxic compared to cannabis. That's why I say I don't think you need to have another person interpose between the patient and their treatment yeah. and their therapy. You know, it's a uh, try it and see. Yeah. Um, to get to uh, a little uh, myth busting, uh, I think um, uh, as part of our, uh, some of our esteemed colleagues would counsel people, don't take medical marijuana, it will impact your cancer therapy, it may interact with your chemo drugs and make them less effective or more toxic. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. So, you know, again, I've been an oncologist in San Francisco for 41 years, and I suspect that probably 40 to 50 percent of the patients that I see are using cannabis. I just did a group visit today and it was about supplements and cannabis. And eight, six out of the eight people in that group were cannabis, current cannabis users. So, you know, and I've treated and cured many patients of cancer over those 41 years who use cannabis. So, that, that's smoking cannabis, I'd say. Now that we're so much more sophisticated and we have all these oils and tinctures and other delivery system, plus the cannabis is uh, not your, not my college cannabis when I went to Brown many years ago. Uh, you know, there are some things to worry about. And again, not to shout out CBD all the time as my least favorite cannabinoid, but CBD blocks the enzymes that metabolize drugs. So patients taking high doses of CBD oils or tinctures do run the risk of getting increased toxicity from their cancer therapies. So I'm not happy with that. I've done two pharmacokinetic interactions, so as I mentioned, the one between inhaled cannabis and opiates. I also did inhaled cannabis and protease inhibitors in AIDS patients. And inhalation of cannabis, I don't think is going to alter the pharmacokinetics of any drugs. The only thing that's been studied in, in cancer was the cannabis tea didn't change the levels of irina tea can uh, in people. But you know you can't do traditional pharmacokinetic interaction studies because you're certainly not going to give healthy controls, chemotherapy, and cannabis to see what happens. I think for me, the only thing that, that bothers me a little bit uh, is some of the results that the Israelis have uh, from uh, observational studies of people using immunotherapy and cannabis. And maybe here I should uh, show a slide for a minute just to show what it is that I'm concerned about if I could. Let me just see why I can't do this. Uh, hang on. That's not what I'm looking for. Oh, I think it's, there we go. Yeah. We're seeing your slides. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm I'm just trying to um hang on. So so the Israelis, uh they're not every patient in Israel who gets cannabis uh gets a uh, license, and the license allows them to be questioned. So this is a study of uh, patients who are using cannabis or not using cannabis. And again, it's not a randomized control trial, but it's uh, two different groups compared observationally. And in the group that used cannabis, it took three months before their tumor progressed compared to 13 months in the group that didn't use cannabis. Even more startling, the overall survival in the group that didn't use cannabis was 28 months. But in the group that used cannabis, the survival was six months. Well, that's pretty different. So I said, how could that possibly be? So when you look at the difference between the patients, in the patients who didn't use cannabis, they were more often than not getting their immunotherapy as a first line drug. Whereas those patients who did use cannabis were statistically significantly getting cannabis as a second or third line drug where it would be less likely to be effective. So I wondered if that was the difference. And so I asked Gil Barcella and he said, no, his statisticians corrected for that 
and cannabis still led to shorter survival. So then some of his colleagues published a paper, the use of medical cannabis concomitantly with immune checkpoint inhibitors in lung cancer, a sigh of relief. So what they did, they had 201 patients, 102 used cannabis and 99 didn't. And most of them were using it for pain, followed by loss of appetite. Time to tumor progression was six months in the cannabis naive group and 5.6 months in those who use cannabis. So that is pretty much the same. However, again, overall survival was 55 months in those who didn't use cannabis compared to 23 in those who didn't. And that was not quite statistically significant, but certainly it looks significant here on this survival curve. Another two year difference in survival, despite the fact that the effect on the tumor was the same. So I said, well, how could that be? So I looked and people that use cannabis were more likely to have liver or brain metastases compared to those who didn't. Those were both nearly statistically significant. So that might be the reason, but in the meantime, I think we don't know. Now, one of the studies that I mentioned that the government funded is an observational study being done at the University of Buffalo in New York of patients on immunotherapy using cannabis compared to those who didn't in a prospective fashion. So maybe that will shed some light on this. But at this point in time, I actually, since I do most of my visits via telehealth, I show patients those slides and I say, I'm a little concerned. Yeah, yeah. I was wonder, seems like that, that just uh, really raises the siren cry for a need for some randomized a trial or just at least some uh, assessment of, it, it seems intuitively obvious, the people who register for the medical marijuana card have symptoms they're trying to treat probably. And we know people who are symptomatic from their cancer don't fare as well uh, than, than those who have no symptoms. I wonder if that- Well, the other thing is that some people say that cannabis is anti-inflammatory and that the immunotherapies require inflammation to eradicate yeah. the tumor. Yeah. But the studies show that the tumor effect on the tumor was the same. And yeah. so why would the effect on survival be so different? It, it might be um, maybe a little over sophisticated for, for this meeting, but <laughs> I have seen purported mechanisms that um, both THC might directly and cannabinoids might indirectly augment the immune response, uh, which th that seems to be the obvious, the opposite of uh, the yeah, yeah. precautionary data you just uh, showed. Is there, do you think there's anything to that? Um, do, do you think uh, cannabinoids can sti help stimulate the immune system? It sounds like- Well, not. you know, again, the CB2 receptor was initially found on cells of the immune system. And in my first study that I ever did on in patients with HIV uh, of dronabinol versus marijuana versus dronabinol placebo, we found that the people smoking marijuana uh, did have uh, increases in their T lymphocytes, their, uh, the building block cell, the immune system. So, and we really did a very extensive uh, battery of immune studies and didn't find any, uh, you know, inhibition of the immune system, but maybe some augmentation. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I, you know, I tell our oncology buddies that maybe we do need to be careful in patients on immunotherapy. Interesting. Um, some practical uh, uh, points. Um, what what do you tell people who say, I I'm just gonna get my marijuana from the street as opposed to I'm going to go to the dispensary and pay double? Yeah, I don't think we, I'm not sure, but I don't think we have that much of a street industry anymore. In fact, yeah. most of the people that used to live in Eureka and grow for selling on the street, uh, I hear it's a ghost town now. So. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know how much of street stuff we have anymore, but you know, I always say I think you're safer in a dispensary because I think I'm not sure about in Connecticut, but you know, we have to have everything labeled, what's in it, what percent is this, it has to be checked to make sure there aren't toxins or you know, so I think you'd be better off and safer getting cannabis from a dispensary rather than the street. Now, you also want to know about growing your own. And I think that that's a really good question because 
you know, I find that uh, many of my patients, I ask all of my cancer patients, what brings you joy? And the number of patients who say that gardening brings them joy is not insignificant. I think if you feel that you're dying or part of you has died, the ability to bring life out of the ground is very powerful. And if you can grow your own medicine, that's quite empowering as well. So I think if people want to take the time and effort to grow their own marijuana, that's a lovely thing to do. But I think it is easier to get stuff at a dispensary probably. Yeah. And br bringing it full circle, uh, Dr. Abrams, I think that one of, the, one of the themes we touched on in the beginning is nothing in isolation, not one element of the uh, the marijuana plant and, and not just marijuana as part of integrative therapy. So where do you put medical marijuana in your whole uh, pantheon of uh, integrative medicine? Yeah, well, again, as I mentioned, I so when I see a new cancer patient, uh, I tell them that cancer is like a weed and other people are taking care of your weed and it's my job to work with the garden and make your soil as inhospitable as possible to growth and spread of the weed because I'm not treating their cancer, I'm treating the person living with cancer. And I say, I do that by, see, by looking to see how you fertilize your garden. That is what you eat and what supplements you take. And then I launch into a 20 minute discussion about nutrition and cancer. And then I review in the medical record what's listed as their medications and supplements. And what I find, certainly I, in my group visit today, uh, patients may have their medications listed, but their oncologists are not gonna list their supplements like I do. Yeah. In fact, I went to my own doctor and they sent me my medication list and said, look at it and see if anything needs to be corrected. So when I went to him, I said, well, I'm not taking this prescription drug, but I am taking this. <clears throat> and let's do my supplements because you, you're really out of date. And so he, he did the first two and he said, let's just keep it simple. <laughs> and yeah. and yeah. so, you know, so I add medical cannabis to a supplement because it is on our drop down menu in our electronic medical record, as is CBD. So, you know, for me, it's a supplement and it's a very useful supplement because of all of the activities that it may have. I mean, I say if there's one medication or one treatment that I can recommend for pain, nausea, appetite, sleep, anxiety, and depression, instead of writing prescriptions for six or seven different pharmaceuticals that may all interact with each other or with the cancer treatment I'm, I'm giving, I think it's a, it's a benefit. Yeah, fantastic. Well, what a fabulous uh, discussion, uh, Dr. James. I, I'm going to open it up to audience. If there are any questions, please uh, put them in the chat. We have a couple more golden moments from California. Yeah, we've had your East Coast heat here the past few days. They said this was the hottest week in San Francisco in 86 years and the wow. third hottest on record since 1886. Wow. Yeah, it was terrible. We don't have air conditioning, remember? So, I know, yeah, that's yeah. crazy. That's crazy. Or heat. <laughs> well, we have heat. <laughs> yeah, but not in my apartment, we didn't. Uh, not really. Um, okay, well, uh, Dr. again, I really want to thank you for an engaging, wonderful uh, evening. Um, and uh, Amy just said hello in the chat. Yeah, I see it. Like, I see it. <laughs> we'll send you some pictures. Uh, right. And thanks, we look forward to... Uh, learning more about the role of uh, medical marijuana in cancer medicine. We do have a, another question here about- Okay, oh yeah. Um, so I guess the, the question is a follow-up on immunotherapy and do you believe the benefits outweigh the risk while using immunotherapy? Again, the answer is I don't know. And so I tell patients just what's out there and hopefully the study being done and in Buffalo will help elucidate uh, the reality there. All right. Thank you. Okay. That's it. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah, great to see you. Bye-bye. Thanks.